Welcome to Zoom In, Zoom Out, your global look at news from Taiwan and around the region. I'm Jeremy Olivier. China's economy is the world's second largest, but it's been stumbling for several years now. China's economic growth last year beat official forecasts, but GDP growth doesn't always equal a healthy economy. Overall recovery since the COVID-19 pandemic has been much less steady than many analysts had expected. And a prolonged downturn in China's property market was once again brought into sharp focus. That was when Chinese real estate giant Evergrande was forced to liquidate by a Hong Kong court. Arguably, no one is feeling the pinch from China's economic downturn more than its young people. Before we zoom in on the challenges faced by the country as a whole, let's first take a look at how a skyrocketing youth unemployment rate is leading many to adopt a more simplistic lifestyle. Our reporter Rosie Greninger has this report. Putting a corporate career dream to rest, Shanghai-based Chu Yi has found happiness in a hobby she hopes can one day make her an income. Facing an economic slump and bleak employment prospects, the 23-year-old is one of many young people in China choosing to take care of their personal well-being and pursue a more minimalistic approach to life. She now works one day a week to support herself through a tattoo artist apprenticeship. Dubbed Lying Flat, this trend sees the nation's younger generation working only to cover basic living expenses and dedicating their time to leisure or personal interests. The jobless rate of China's 280 million youth aged 16 to 24 rose to a record high of just over 21% last year, as the economy struggles to return to pre-pandemic levels. Back in the studio, we're joined today by Ann Stevenson Yang, co-founder of stock research firm J Capital Research, here to talk about what China's faltering economy could mean for business in the region and around the world. Now, Anne's experience in China spans multiple decades, and her extensive resume includes stints as journalist, economist, book author, publisher, and entrepreneur, and that's just to name a few. And it's a real pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you, Jeremy. So let's first zoom in on what's happening on the ground in China. Can you just give us a rough breakdown of the challenges that the country is facing right now? Sure. So, so China, ever since the reform and opening in the early 1980s, has been an investment-driven economy. And that was always going to end because you just have to keep accelerating the investment as you, the assets that you're investing in are less productive. And so you build up all these bad assets. So it was going to end. And the real estate mania, the Chinese government fed, starting from the, the great global financial crisis in 2009, just accelerated to an extent where it just couldn't accelerate anymore. And the toppling of real estates from 2021 is what's brought down the economy. You mentioned the real estate crisis. You know, you were an early alarm sounder about Evergrande. I think uh, you mentioned that you were concerned about its solvency all the way back in 2014. So what at the time indicated that the country or the company might not be in the best shape? Well, it shows how I'm not very good at, at predicting the stock market. So, so what show, you know, I, I traveled around China a lot to, you know, all these little blue roads in China, and I saw uh, probably a hundred Evergrande projects. And even in 2012, 2013, 2014, they were all sold, but not occupied. And so you'd see these people walking around a, a place that had been built for, let's say, 60,000 people, and there were actually 5,000 people in residence. And so the rest of the buyers would think, wow, this is really beautiful. It's so bucolic, not like the rest of China. And they would imagine that in the future, uh, not only would the value of their property rise, but they would have this beautiful, you know, quiet place. That didn't happen. So, you know, for most of the century, China has experienced this really breakneck economic growth. Uh, and millions of its citizens have been, you know, had their livelihoods made better. So, you know, why are we now seeing such a pronounced decline in the economy? Well, because of the, the crash of the investment economy. So what happened 
especially since the global financial crisis, is that China, China's leadership poured cash on the economy. And so everybody felt good about it. Everybody saw their, not really their incomes, but their, their asset values rising. So everybody got rich off capital appreciation. They're, they sold their land if they were a farmer. They, uh, they flipped their apartment. They made money in the stock market. And so everybody took cash and went off to the casinos in Macau and so on and so forth. But that ended. And in the meantime, China had not really invested in its human capital. So education, health, the hukou system is still in place. None of those things got better. So you still have basically, as pro the property mania goes away, you still have China in the same situation that it was in in 2008. So given that, you know, how much would you say the situation in China right now is a result of failures in its growth model overall? And how much would you attribute to like the current leadership? Well, the current leadership has been particularly clumsy. Um, I think that there's this concept that uh, there, there was always a concept in Chinese governance throughout the uh, the early years of reform that, well, if things don't go well, people can go back to the farm. People can, you know, farm barley or whatever they're doing, and you know, it'll be okay. What I think the current leadership failed to fully understand is that assets became very important, not just income. And so they have been very clumsy about this, and the crackdown on real estate that that sort of crashed the market in summer of 2021 could have been a lot more delicate. That said, everybody blames Xi Jinping. I think really it was just something that was going to happen. You wrote not too long ago that the habit of the Chinese government on, on this, on, at least recently, on cracking down on billionaires, probably not the way for it to go. You know, what, what would you think would be a better route for it to kind of resolve some of these issues? The Chinese central government has always been very concerned about taking Chinese money out of the, of the country. So that, I think, was the source of all the concern about the Dalian Wandas and Anbangs and, and HNAs of 2018. So what they would do is take a whole bunch of cre renminbi credit within China, and then they would buy overseas assets. And they were mostly overpriced overseas assets. So the government got very concerned, like, you shouldn't take our dollars overseas. What, how are we going to get those back? So they sort of pulled back on all of that in a very sort of abrupt way that I think has made entrepreneurs very anxious about going back to China. What I would do, you know, what I would do is, is allow the, the Chinese consumer to buy stuff, open up the economy, make it a consumption economy instead of an investment economy, but that's not what's going to happen. So given what you've observed over the past several years, you know, do you see things getting better for China, domestically at least, anytime soon? I do not, because I think that, um, that, that the paramount concern for the, uh, the, the current government in China, the, the, the Communist Party, is to stay in power. And so as things become worse economically, really their only choice is going to be to, to become more and more restrictive to keep people from migrating so much, to keep people from saying things about the government. And you can see that happening now. And uh, I want to zoom out now and look at what all this means for those doing business with China. So, you know, so much of the region and the world now relies on trade and investment with China. So how would this balance be affected by um, a faltering Chinese economy? It's kind of like a film running backwards. So just as through the 1990s, you saw all of these companies rushing into China to to manufacture and the Chinese currency got more expensive and so on and so forth, all of that is going to move backwards. But the effects of the, uh, the weakness in the Chinese economy, I would say on first order, it's a weakness in foreign companies that are invested in China, their stocks of their listed companies, their other results if they're not listed companies. So you're, you're seeing a reduction in FDI, for example. In, on second order, it's countries that rely on exports to China, like uh, Australia and iron ore, Canada and potash. U.S. is still exporting a lot of soybeans, but that's got to be a concern because as China feels the need to stimulate more, it's going to push the currency down. So you're going to see 
a cheaper Chinese currency, and that will be difficult for Chinese imports. And the third order is that, um, that eventually the, the Chinese leadership, right now they're acting kind of like a tiger in a cage. They just want things to be better, but they don't know how to, they, they, can't, they can't make it better, they can't stimulate without crushing the currency. So they're just pacing around, sort of getting angry. Eventually they're going to have to just pour cash on the economy, that's going to crush the currency. And when that happens, China will sort of push uh, deflation into the world. I find that interesting because you know, China now stakes a lot of its international legitimacy and credibility on the relationships it has with countries it does extensive business with. So do you think that we'll do anything maybe policy-wise to try to maintain those relationships and, and avoid some of what you're talking about? I do not. I think that the, uh, the opening to other countries was strategic and temporary. Uh, so there was a, a period during which Chinese leaders were very, very open to the West. They started to wear you know, Western clothes. They started to meet everybody who came to Beijing. They started to learn English and study foreign laws and things like that. All of that is, is changing now. And I think that China is basically closing its doors again. So foreign direct investment fell precipitously into, into China last year, and it's now lower than at any point since 1993. What would you say is causing this trend, and should we expect to see more FDI leaving China in the near future? I think that you're seeing uh, companies, uh, direct foreign investors, uh, be concerned with the, with the risk associated with their capital. It's not like they're all just going home. They're, they're spreading their, their, uh, their capital into other countries as well. Mexico became the largest exporter to the U.S. just last month, or last year, I guess, in displacing China. That was kind of a big shift. Um, a lot of the exports, of course, are from Chinese companies that are based in Mexico, but it just means that it's not like there's going to be a new China that's sort of, you know, the massive manufacturing base for the world, but it means that people are splitting up their risk. What would a continued exodus of foreign investment mean for China? Well, I think that the key is that China still needs foreign, uh, foreign, foreign technology as well as capital, and that is going to be uh, difficult to access. So it means you know, less employment for the more highly educated set, Within China, it means a weakening in the in the key cities, uh, which will, of course, concern the leadership politically, um, and it means a general impoverishment. Taiwan's economy is, of course, very heavily intertwined with that of China's, uh, maybe more than any other country at this point. Do you think, from what you've observed, that it's done enough to disentangle itself from its much larger neighbor? You know, that is very hard to say. Ta Taiwanese tech economy in particular is, is very deeply intertwined with China's. The positive portion of that is that Taiwan has kept very high value portions of tech within Taiwan and not transferred them to China. So in the chip economy, which is particularly critical, I, I mean the term Silicon Shield, that's sort of Taiwan's you know, core asset, I think. We've also seen a notable increase in the number of people leaving um, China in general, Chinese people leaving the country, and many, you know, are citing poor economic conditions and growing repression at home. You know, do you think this phenomenon will continue? I think that the government makes it as hard as they can for capital and people to exit. Uh, but you remember during the, the 1960s, you had, in the 1950s, you had sort of a bamboo network of, of Chinese capital spreading around the world as uh, the capital didn't want to be in China. I think that you'll see a good bit of that now. And it's been a really insightful conversation. Really appreciate you coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. This has been Zoom In, Zoom Out. For more stories from Taiwan Plus News, please follow us on social media. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.